Welcome. This is a extra, extra special breath to breath because I have the pleasure of interviewing and introducing my father, Dr. John R. White. Hey, Dad, how are you? Hey, Perrin. How you doing? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. Well, let's start with introducing you and sharing all, all the really profound accomplishments that that you've you've got underway, as well as how you've greatly influenced me and get to chatting. Sound good? Sounds good. All right. Well, Dad or Doctor Watt. <laughs> I won't. Uh, he has been uh, a dentist. He practiced general dentistry since 1979 when he graduated from the University of Texas Dental School and had a practice in Beaumont with my grandfather, his dad, and then moved to Greenville in 1986. And there he had a really successful practice for over 40 years and then a sleep practice for 25 years. For a while, he was the only AA DSM, the American Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine certified uh, dentist in South Carolina. We don't know if that's what that is now, but for a while it was that. He's also won several awards. He got the AADSM Clinical Research Award in 2011. He also is a FOM, a Fellowship of Oral Facial Myology from the uh, International Association of Oral Facial Myology. And I think one of the coolest things you ever did, Dad, was the paper you had published in 2017. It was from the American Journal of Osteopathic Medicine, Rapid Maxillary Expansion, and Adoid Tonsillectomy in Nine-Year-Old Twins with Pediatric Obstructive Sleep Apnea Syndrome and Interdisciplinary Effort. And then you sent me your CV. You've got all these things that you had been on the boards of. I mean, and then also graduating from the LD Panky Institute of Advanced Dental Studies. You've uh, started the South Carolina Dental Sleep Medicine in 1991. That was your sleep practice. I mean, you were on peer review view boards. You served as the president of the Greenville County Dental Association, as well as owning a business, being a dad, figuring all these things out. So great job, dad. I'd say a very successful career. <laughs> oh, it's average. <laughs> oh, you're being, you're being modest. Well, I just wanted to say thank you. I, I really have admired and been inspired by our conversations. And part of the reason that that I even get to do what I do is because I was thinking about when we were when we were going to chat that we just get to have conversations about the mouth and the airway. And I got to watch and see what you were doing. And even if it wasn't applicable at the time, I definitely soaked it up and I got my love of reaching out and learning and being fearless and asking questions from you because I saw you do that and that's how you were able to to reach all of these these milestones as well as these accomplishments but also I think it just came from you wanting to know more and and so with that let's start the first question of what's your breath of origin story and for you it could be how did you get into dental sleep medicine like what what was this journey like for you? How did it pull you in and what kept you going? Uh, well, I had a, uh, in my general dental practice, I had a sleep doctor. Uh huh. And um, one day he was in for something and asked me if I wanted to go to a dental uh, or a uh, sleep medicine conference in uh, Los Angeles. And so, um, I went out there with him and I didn't know anything about, I never even heard of sleep apnea. Uh -huh. Certainly I didn't know anything about what, uh, what Dennis could do for it. Um, so anyway, he and I started uh, working together a little bit. He showed me what these appliances, we use dental appliances that go in their, in your mouth. Yeah. Um, and what he was hunting for um, was somebody who could help them because what they did would be put people on CPAP. Right. Which is the uh, positive air pressure that you have to wear over your nose or mouth. Um, and at that time, they were extremely hard for people to wear. Probably half the people couldn't wear them. Yeah. Uh, another thing he would do is uh, send them for uh, <clears throat> a surgery where they cut out a lot of the soft palate to try to make room back in the in the pharynx 
Mm -hmm. But that really wasn't, that didn't turn out to be real successful. For, so he needed some more options yeah. on what to do for these people. So anyway, you know, I started learning about them and uh, seeing the patients. And then he would have uh, conferences with his ENT guy and his neurologist and his cardiologist. And um, I would come and listen to them. And so I started getting interested in it and kind of took it from there. Yeah. Well, because I mean, I I can remember coming to your office as a child and um and it's like you slowly kind of grew. And and I feel like that's honestly how all how all really evolutions happen normally. It's like lots of little small changes. Like slowly you started adding like overnight sleep studies. And then slowly you would kind of start showing us more things. And Aaron, I did Yeah. Can I can I answer a phone call? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Van, Van, can you unrecord it? Yeah, I'll pause. Van. <laughs> All right, had a little telephone break. Uh, basically, I was just telling you how, um, oh, and here's Vanna. Vanna's here, dad's here, we're all here. Basically how I just noticed in your practice, even if I wasn't fully sure what you were doing and maybe you weren't even fully sure like how you were transitioning, but I just know that the conversations at home would slowly start to change. And And honestly, what I really remember the most is when I was in Dallas and undergrad, you came to visit because there was a doctor in Dallas that you, Dr. Thornton, and it was the, what was the appliance that he used? It was the uh, it's called a tap. A tap. It was the Thornton apparatus. No, oh. Thornton anterior positioner. Position. Yeah. And you'd work with him a lot. You collaborate with him as well as go to lots of different conferences. And I remember thinking, I know what apnea and um, I know what apnea is even though I don't really know what anything else is. I knew the word before I really even knew what it meant because it just kept coming up in conversation. And can you tell everyone a little bit about all the things that you've done in your own search for, for increasing and improving, increasing your upper airway as well as improving your overall health? Because watching you go through these physical and anatomical changes definitely helped paved the way for me to do the same with my airway surgery and and tongue tie and lip tie and tots releases well i mean there's a lot of oh man that's i can remember all this i i, I can help you because i remember some of it i know you well you, you had your jaw broken didn't you yeah well i, I snored yeah and so um you know, I knew, and then I started meeting other sleep doctors here and so forth. And so I had some sleep studies done on me and I had, I had mild apnea. So I, I wore a, um, I like that tap of clients. That's the one I did wow. most office. I, I probably did over 2000 of those things. Wow. Yeah, I did a lot of them <clears throat> and they were really effective. Um, so I, I wore one for about 10 years. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, then uh, at some point I got into the children because I started seeing um, maybe how to prevent apnea. Mm -hmm. uh, and it had to do with um, uh, how the face grows and how the nasal cavity uh, can affect the collapsibility of the upper airway yeah. and so forth. And so I started taking courses in that. And one of them was from a lady in Philadelphia who was an orthodontist. Yeah. Um, and she did a lot of maxillary expansions, um, you know, for children. And then they got them into the adults. Um, but you can't really do maxillary expansion on adults very well. You have to go ahead and have your upper jaw uh, broken. Yeah. And then they can put the expansion device in. And, you did know, you, it, you did I did that. all that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I wore all that. Yeah. Went through all that and lost about 15 pounds because I couldn't eat anything. Right. And didn't really like it. But anyway, I got through all that. And then I had to have orthodontics yeah. for my new, you know, jaw placement. Yeah. But the bottom line was, is I was pretty much able to not have to use any appliances or CPAPs or uh, really much of anything because I started breathing better right and and honestly I 
us talking about this, I'm realizing let's for the listeners, let's just explain what exactly what exactly is sleep apnea and well the the yeah. that, that what happens is is the upper airway from the base of your tongue down to the trachea. Yeah. It, yeah. It's yeah. not really yeah, down there to the past, yeah, you know, right to that white thing. Oh, it, our vocal folds? Yeah. Okay. Right there. Um, around that little space, there is no uh, bone or cartilage. There's nothing yeah. really firm. Yeah. Um, and so it's really, um, it, it collapses so easy. Yeah. And some of the some of the anatomy courses I, I take when we started looking at those uh, at that area of the I remember the instructor says uh, that muscle that holds your airway open is so flimsy I don't even know how to stay alive. <laughs> <clears throat> so it can it can what what will happen is if you get too much negative pressure. Yeah. The more you have to breathe, it, it your your lungs are working. Um, there's a lot more effort, and so um, it creates a vacuum yeah. in that little, about an inch long area, and so it will suck all those little muscles together. Like yeah, right in there. It will just suck them together. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, uh, you, you've got like the cork put into the bottle. You right. can't get any air pass, passing through there. Right. So you're you're asleep. You don't know this, but um, what will happen is your oxygen levels in your body will start dropping, mm -hmm. and then eventually the alarm button hits and you'll gasp and make some kind of thrashing sound. Yeah, and that airway will open back up, get more tone in those muscles. Right, and then well, happen over and over and over all night long. Right. Well, and, and what I tell clients a lot too, is like, this is when you're upright, when you go to sleep, you're on your back and there's even more. Well, yeah, that tongue, that tongue gravity pulls that tongue yeah. down into yeah. that little opening. So that, that's sleep apnea. And I know that there's central and then also, um, oh. Well, it's obstructive and central. And obstructive, obstructive yeah. is the one that's where you have something physically obstructive. Yeah. Central is more. Um, it's kind of a uh, neurological condition. Right. Well, and then the can problem we talk is, is um, if you have all those interruptions through the night, yeah, is you don't stay in deep sleep long enough. And that's where all your repair and growth hormones and everything are produced. And so people just are not, and it's chronic. It's every night for right. years and years. And it finally just wears your body down. How much and for children, for children, it it delays um, the learning. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, how much deep sleep do you think we should be getting each night? Uh, usually, you get about 25% of your sleep night in REM. REM, okay. Um, well, I was going to say, so that's sleep apnea being the obstructive and the central. But then what I ended up having was that upper airway resistance. So I wasn't necessarily having apneic events, but I was just having enough resistance that I could never get deep, deep sleep. And you were pretty, you were pretty um, involved with helping me find that diagnosis. I mean, God, like back when I actually did the, do you remember when I did the in, in clinic sleep study? And it came back idiopathic hypersomnia, which just meant they didn't know why I was getting tired. Right. I mean, but it was the upper airway resistance. So I didn't have the clinical markers of like an AHI, the, the AHI, that's the apnea hypoxia index. Yeah. yeah. Um, so well, I didn't you know they, uh, go they have um, the, the way they diagnose it and the way insurance will pay for it is you, you have to have uh, five apneic events yeah. per hour to be diagnosed as mild sleep apnea. But what happens if you have four? <laughs> they don't have a word for that. And so they finally decided to call that uh, airway resistance. Okay. And so a disruptive event 
where you the oxygen has gone down and all of a sudden your alarm button hits. Those are those are. Um, I mean, it'd be the same thing as if Anna hopped in bed with you and scratched you. Yeah. I mean, it'd just wake you up. Yeah. So events, uh, you know, events can be anything. Yeah. But the, but it, the struggle to breathe can cause an event too. Right. So right. Young people usually, young healthy looking people usually will have the um, upper airway resistance. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, but I mean, to me, it's kind of like the canary in the coal mine. If you have that, then you're on your way to having full blown obstructive apnea. It's well, just, you know, you already know your airway is susceptible to collapse. Yeah. So, if you gain any weight, yeah, you get more fat around your, your, you know, that soft tissue. Yeah. Or if you drink some, you know, wine. Or yeah. Yeah. All those kind of things. No, absolutely. I mean, that that's part of the reason I got the aura ring is because I wanted to keep tabs on it. And, and what I love is like, you can't, you can't change what, what you're not unaware of. And so even now I like got you and I both. So I think we both, we both had some kind of airway surgery. I had my septum, my deviated septum fixed, my turbidates reduced, my tonsils removed. You had your jaw broken. I think you had your septum. Yeah, I had, I had all the nasal surgery too. Yeah. I had, I had polyps and I had turbinates that are all screwed up. And yeah, if your nose, if the air doesn't flow through your nose good, if it's got a lot of little turns, that's just one more thing to make it harder to get the air right. stuck hard. Right. So we fixed our airways and then you got your tongue tie released and I had mine and my lip tie and buckle ties released. So we fixed the reasons that our airways were obstructive and narrow and small and maybe just for our listeners also briefly I, i'd love i feel like you do a really good job of making complex complex topics very simple so in your in your gift of a gift of explanation how would you explain Nate, why that happened to us both of us like why did we both get deviated septums why is our palate small why I, you know, I don't know. There's a lot of, well, you know, it all starts with the craniofacial growth. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, when you're young and uh, outside influences um, are, are on you, um, if you don't, if you don't uh, breastfeed, mm -hmm. if you don't get that, that, that um, sucking, swallowing reflex. Um, little bitty things, I mean, you wouldn't even believe it, will uh, affect how your upper jaws and your lower jaws grow. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the airflow through your nose um, will stimulate the, the upper jaw to grow. Mm -hmm. um, and if it doesn't grow wide enough, your, your upper jaw and your nasal cavity or, or like an upstairs, downstairs. Uh, you remember this that you gave me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so this and this, they are connected. Yeah, show them the palate. Right, if, that, if that palate, if that palate doesn't grow wide enough, right. then what's right above it is the nasal cavity. Right. And so it won't be wide enough. And if it's too small and all those little things in the middle of the turbinates will start getting crooked yeah and it, it's just going to make airflow a lot lot tougher absolutely um, well and, and then also as kids we're so much more malleable I mean you can make such substantial changes with less effort because everything is not solidified like our bones oh yeah the bones are like a little wax I and mean, that don't yeah. move so easy yeah so and when would you the tongue, the tongue will if the tongue doesn't work right. Yeah. The tongue is the strongest muscle in a in a little baby's whole body. Yeah. And it's it, it will push the jaw if it swallows correctly. Yeah. Then it pushes and forms that upper palate to the the shape of the tongue. The right. I know. And so uh if you don't if you if you have your mouth open and you swallow your tongue's too far from your palate, it won't get all the way up yeah. there. It's just going to come out in between your teeth. 
Right. Well, and what I think is so interesting is we both know this now, but growing up, I think you were discovering it and I just discovered it a lot later. I mean, I can think back of member in Texas at the dude ranch when I kept getting ear infections and your mom Babs would go get pills. And of course I couldn't couldn't swallow swallow the pill. And that was a big, I remember that was a big event, but I couldn't swallow because my tongue was tied and I had a tongue thrust swallow and the pill was too big. And then I was getting anxious. So then my muscles were cramping up. And then what, did you have any thoughts or when, when I was a senior in high school and do you remember my superlative most likely to fall asleep during graduation? Were you were you starting to pick up on, on well, like one of the things about uh, sleep problems yeah. is people don't get enough sleep and they're sleepy. Right, right. So when anybody's sleepy, um, you always think about sleep apnea or you know sleep and breathing problems. Yeah, so of course, you know that was kind of in my mind. Yeah. Well, and honestly, something I think has been really interesting, and I know you've experienced this too, is when you know what you know, it's hard not to share it. But then, I mean, honestly, Dad, I was a little resistant to, I was a little, I was a little resistant to take any of your advice because I wasn't thinking it was coming from a, a, a dental sleep practitioner. I was like, oh, it's just Dad, it's just Dad, or like it might be a cousin or a brother or a sibling or a friend, and and I think it's a really delicate dance of like dropping seeds so like sharing yeah, it's, it's, hard. it's it's kind of an abstract thought yeah you can't really touch it and feel it yeah uh, and you yeah. know we try to go like when i first started um and after i got confidence that those oral appliances work right then i would try to go by and, and see some you know doctors because they all had patients in their practice that couldn't wear their seat belt. yeah and you just could not get it through to them how that worked. Yeah. And there, at the time, there were, I mean, you know, it was kind of like we were just discovering this thing. So there weren't any articles out. Right. Of course, now, 30 or 40 years later, there's, you know, 50,000. Uh-huh. uh-huh. Well, one, well, one, I mean, one by you. Yeah. So the science is, is solid. Yeah. You don't have to convince them anymore. But then the, the children, you know, the pediatricians don't understand um, tongue ties or swallowing problems. And if you ask them if, a, if any of their patients mouth breathe, they won't know what you're talking about. Yeah. And they look at you funny. And so it's just, it's, it's very hard to get it across to, to people. Well, I, I think it's because of people like you that started this 30, 40 years ago and kept on with it that honestly, do you know that there's a diagnostic code for mouth breathing now? Really? Yeah, I, I absolutely. I think it's like R O six, maybe 0.5. I'll look into that, but I mean, it's, it's definitely caught on. That's why that's why I know what myofunctional therapy is because of you. And actually, I think we're the only FOM calm. So you have your fellowship of oral facial myology. I have my certification in oral facial myology. And what I love too is, and I, I talked on this earlier, I just just want to say thank you for letting me have these conversations because I now I now look for patterns across all different disciplines. Like I love when it really clicked for me is when I started seeing the patterns in speech pathology, my functional therapy, yoga, lifestyle patterns, just patterns in general of breathing and how you can address it in different ways. And something that I love that you do is you do metaphors and analogies and stories really well, because that's how people understand. And so I also try to use lots of simple analogies, metaphors, stories, because that's how I understand as well. And then what I love too, is I can remember going to your office and you would just be on the phone or you would tell me like, oh yeah, I just called up this guy or I called up this person. Like you would have some connection. I'm like, how do you know them? You're like, I just called them. And I thought that was always really cool. So like, tell me, how would you find people to connect with? Like, was it, was it any like rhyme or reason or was it just what you felt interested in? Well, you know, you just, you just find, you start reading things. Yeah. And you find, find out who wrote them. Yeah. They mentioned names in there about 
people they learn stuff from or you're in an organization that have a lot of people you don't know but um, are doing the same thing but maybe have been doing it longer yeah um, and you know just finding out little things little things can make the difference mm -hmm. um, and so you just might pick up one little tidbit um, and so right. I don't know. I always just, I'm just curious. Um, and, um, you know, just dug it out. Well, as I say, if you're not curious. I mean, it I really wasn't very hard to, to yeah. find. I mean, there's so many people that know more than, you, than I do or you yeah. do or everybody. Well, I think if it's. You want to learn, you just got to go find out how the good people are doing it. Yeah. Yeah, no, I I would 100% agree with that. Okay, so we've gone over sleep apnea. We've gone over what we've done to kind of address our issues. Let's talk about current sleep regimen because I know that we have lots of conversations about sleep. So what are you doing currently to try to get your best night's sleep? Like what are you doing to maintaining to maintain the sleep that you can get? Um. <clears throat> Well, I don't have to wear any appliances anymore. Yeah. But I still do. Uh, I still take. Yeah. And um, I think that's done a couple of things. Is you know trying to trying to talk to people about uh, keeping their mouth shut and breathing through their nose. Right. Um, I can remember I was in this gym class just a couple of years ago, and the instructor had just or the the guy who ran the class. Um, had been to some seminar they talked about uh, nasal breathing. Mm -hmm. So he had the class do all these. We used to have to push these trawlers, these heavy things, down this track and back. I mean, where you out? And boy, everybody in the class. You know, <laughs> but I could keep my mouth shut and breathe mm -hmm. through my nose. Mm -hmm. And I think it comes from not consciously thinking about it because that's hard to keep that thought is taping it at night you just your mouth your lips end up just staying shut yeah and so it's so much easier to, to to nasal breathe during the day because of what you did you know at night yeah yeah so that's really about all i do is um you know is the tape well and uh and what, what, I love, what I love is over Thanksgiving, um, Paula, your your wife, was saying, mm, got to get that mouth tape, start snoring again, John R.W. <laughs> and what I think is so great about that is it's an ongoing maintenance. And I, I too tape, and I can tell the nights that I tape, the nights that I don't, specifically not that I have someone like kicking me or telling me I'm snoring, but essentially this tells me and also i know like you just know when you don't feel good yeah, you wake up and your mouth's all dry yeah and yeah as a dentist that dry mouth people would get more cavities yeah so it was um you know if the patient was open and i felt like they wouldn't just freak out I, yeah <laughs> i mentioned the mouth tape to them right i mean to me the I guess the danger of mouth taping is if you're not going to be able to take it off or unconsciously take it off if you need to be able to breathe. But if you would need to be able to breathe, it'd be something that your nose is having some faulty or dysfunction or your tongue's in the wrong place or it's blocking your airway. But for me, I can tell like if I'm out of practice and if I need to like start working a little bit more on a daily basis of tongue tongue training is because I'll just find find the tape like in a ball all the way across the room all the way across the room or like somehow like pushed underneath the covers or something like that um but but it's yeah. kind of interesting too about you talking about nasal obstructions yeah you know I have never um gotten stopped up really start being us getting when, when you have your uh your tape on but I'll oh. get up right and you know, I'm breathing, I can breathe fine. And I'll take the tape off and walk into the kitchen to get a cup of coffee and I'm stopped up. Yeah. So I've I've already opened my mouth and started over breathing. And I, my nose is stopped. 
Yeah. I, I think it's, it's amazing. Like when you can just become aware of it and then be curious, not critical about, all right, what do I get to do about this? And that's when you start to make long-term changes. And, and what I love too, is like, you get to show your friends the changes that you've made and how it's helped you. And I get to show my friends, you know, what I've done and the changes that it makes. And I think that's how you start to make waves is from those little ripples. And well, you gotta have confidence in what you're doing. Yeah. And if you yeah. see it work, especially if you see it work on yourself. Yeah. Then the patients or the people you're trying to talk into stuff, they can kind of tell if you're a little iffy about it. Uh-huh. But if you really kind of come on really pretty confident. Right. There's an acceptance a lot better. I I absolutely agree with that. And and I think so, something that that I I think I've modeled after you and I didn't quite even realize it is you always tried things out on yourself. Like you always tried these these different treatments and interventions on yourself. And then that's what led you to, to really implement it in your practice. And you know what, I've done the same thing because I, I've done all the surgeries on myself and I've also done the interventions and the training and the awareness and the pattern repositioning and retraining. And then I get to teach it as well. And then we get to do these fun, these fun conversations together. I hope I, I wonder if I, I don't know, I'm just like wondering what would you say was probably the most significant, the significant part about your career or when you think back on your practice and, oh, I know, let's talk about the twins. I mean, like, don't actually, don't let me, don't let me answer your question, but either what would you say is the most significant contribution that you made or something that you remember the most fondly, or we can talk about the twin study. Well, I don't know if there's one thing, but um, two things that we got. Um, one of the sleep doctors here in town, I got real close with. He and I became pretty good friends. Yeah. So we could talk about stuff and play around with things and so forth. And so we we tried these um, on on some of these patients that were severe adenic. Yeah. And you remember I told you you gotta quit breathing five times an hour. Yeah, the AHI. Yeah, to be uh, diagnosed as mild. Well, some of these people would quit breathing a hundred times an hour. Oh man. And so I mean they were really severe. They were really too too bad for a oral appliance. But um if we got an oral appliance in them, and usually if they were severe, like a hundred those CPAP machines were, were like air blowers. Yeah. And so you could turn them, they had a dial, you could turn the pressure where it would just, or it was like a damn jet engine. <laughs> and so um, the higher the, the pressure, the harder for those people to wear them. Yeah. So we put an oil appliance in and because they had their airway somewhat open with the oral appliance, they could take the pressure on their CPAP machines and turn them way down mm -hmm. where they could tolerate them. Mm -hmm. So it was a combination of an oral appliance and the CPAP yeah. that got it where they weren't successful with the CPAP and now they were successful. So we did, we did a study on that and, um, um, that won, the, that, that won an award. Yeah, yeah. We wrote it up. And um, and then we, the other big thing was uh, I had a lady who worked for me. Yeah. And um, so she would hear me talk to all these patients about sleep and stuff. And so one day she came in and she said, Dr. White, my, my one of, she had twin nine-year-olds. Mm -hmm. One of the twins she said, they snore so bad. And she brought me this tape in, and it was uh, one of them on the couch taking a nap. I mean, and it was terrible. Yeah. It, I mean, she didn't breathe hardly at all. So we got them in, and I had these home sleep monitors that patients could take home 
and it'd be a little uh, kind of like a home sleep study. Mm-hmm. And both of them, both of them did it. And one of them quit breathing like 75 times an hour. Yeah. And for a kid, you only have to quit breathing like two or three to be diagnosed as having had. Yeah. But this thing was off the charts bad. Yeah. And so um, that's when we started getting into the children. And um, so we did some, uh, usually it was a combination of large tonsils and small uh, nasal airway because of, you know, palate being too narrow. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, I got hold of a, ENT here in town who did children. He had the tonsils taken out. And then after they healed up, we did maxillary expansion on both of them. And then we retested them. Yeah. And that 75 went down to like, you know, seven or eight. Yeah. And the kids were like, you know, the teachers were saying they're not falling asleep in class anymore. And their attitudes are better and you know, they felt better, and of course, the mama was happy. Yeah. And so, um, uh, we got that published. I got another phone call about my car. All right, a pause. Where were we? All right, well, if anyone's curious, dad's car's about to be okay, but we just learned he's a stop-and-go driver. <laughs> um, I know. Well, no, dad, that study with the, the twins... Yeah, oh yeah. Hugely significant. That, uh, that's what we wrote the article in the osteopathic medical. Yeah. yeah. That was a lot of fun. I got a hired a writer and we had a lot of fun doing yeah. that. Well, it's just really cool to be able to share the the findings and the things that you're seeing in a, a format that lots of people will be able to read and digest and then use to support what you're doing, what they're doing. Um I really think it's a shame these orthodontists don't know about sleep and see how important it is that their expansions, um, how much it can help them. Yeah. Because a lot of times they don't, they know they need to get the jaw widened so they get the teeth to fit better, but they don't widen them enough. Yeah. And so um, they really miss an opportunity to help the, help the child's health, but maybe they'll start learning. Well, I I know there there's been some there's been some that I've interacted with that are are seeing it and starting to make changes or at least open to discussion and and yeah. I just I think maybe a good way to kind of wrap up our conversation is of just thinking of like all right so let's say you're a parent let's say that you've got a child for me what I can think of of what I always recommend is you got to make sure the nose is clear you got to do some kind of nasal breathing awareness you tongue needs to be able to stay up all the time, lips closed, jaw unhinged, working on posture, eating, eating very fibrous foods, making sure you're getting functional, functional work of your jaw in there, um, breastfed if possible. Oh God, get, get away from like these sippy cups, those hard, um, hard spouty cups. Am I forgetting anything? Well, I mean, you know, you can start seeing like that sippy cut. If you if you're sucking, yeah, these, these facial muscles are, are pushing that jaw, yeah, in, which is making it narrow, and so they'll end up having um, not enough not, not enough room for their teeth. Yeah. So crooked teeth is just kind of a new thing, um, and you know, yeah, like and, this guy doesn't have. Yeah, crooked teeth. show turn it up. Yeah, see, you know, back then nobody had crooked teeth. Right. Um, you know, all the archaeologists that pull up those skulls and study those sites, mm-hmm. very rare to see crooked teeth. Mm-hmm. So you can kind of, you know, crooked teeth are a sign the jaws aren't growing right. Yeah. And if your kid wakes up and you go, and their bed's all torn, torn apart. Yeah. Um, because if they get enough deep sleep, you know, you're paralyzed in deep sleep. Yeah. So you're not, you know, thrashing around much. Um, those are some things. And all this ADHD, hyperactivity. Yeah. You know, kids when they're sleepy are hyperactive. That doesn't really make sense, but no, it, that's it how does. it is. So you always gotta think about how they're sleeping. 
if they're getting diagnosed with ADHD. Yeah. So that would be good. So things to look out for as as far as like the sleep as as it relates to airway is if your child is restless during the night, if they have any attention deficit, any dysfunction during the day, um, if they have really tussled tussled sheets. What about bedwetting? I know that's usually yeah, that has that has uh, uh, some sleep components to it. Yeah. Uh, mouth breathing during the day, mouth breathing at night. Um, yeah. I mean, they all, everybody mouth breathes. That's, that's, <laughs> I know that's just, everybody's got a problem. No, well, we're, we're here to help. We're here to help. Yeah. Um, dad, let's wrap up a final question. How's okay. that sound? Um, what does a deep breath mean to you? And when I say that, I mean, it can be, what does good health mean to you? What does that look like? What does that feel like? Or even the anatomical, like what, what does a deep breath entail? But this can be however you, however you want to frame it. But John White, what does a deep breath mean to you? Well, tell me again what I'm supposed to, I don't understand. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. Um, so when when I say what does a deep breath mean to you, I'm talking about like what does good health, what does that feel like to you? Uh well, you know, uh, since we're talking about mouth breathing and breathing, yeah. anybody who walks around like that yeah. is not healthy. Yeah. And um that old guy who uh that Russian Dr. Berteko mm-hmm. who kind of learned all this breathing breathing stuff and he you know there's a lot of potato breathing people around but he was a physician and he had one of his duties was um the end of life ward yeah and he could tell when somebody was about to die because their breathing would speed up and wow. um so open mouth and um, you know, breathing a whole, you know, just too many respirations per minute. Yeah. Is a real sign of health. Yeah. Poor health. Well. Yeah. Keep your lips shut. Lips shut. All right. Is there anything? Hold on. Vanna. <laughs> my dog, my dog's just going to town over here in the corner. Is there anything else we didn't cover that you wanted to share or talk about? Um, not really. Um, I think that probably that's probably the highlights. All right. Well, Dad, Dr. John R. White, I want to say thank you so much for Man, being I a think guest. You're really good. I, I'm proud of you for doing all these things. Thank you. Thank you. Well, from that, thank you for being on Breath to Breath, and I'll have to invite you again if you'll if you'll accept. Yeah, we'll do it some other time. I'll. Uh, pull out some of my old stuff and yeah talk to you about it sounds good well thanks for being here bye Perrin bye